fields again. So it's a pleasure to call Professor David Thomas to stage on, um, for his presentation on precision medicine. So Professor Thomas is an NHMRC investigator fellow and the CEO of the OMICO, the Australian Genomics Cancer Medicine Center. He's also the head of the Genomics Cancer Medicine Laboratory at the Garvin Institute for Medical Research and the inaugural director of the Center for Molecular Oncology at the University of New South Wales. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm definitely not a, a HPC kind of guy. I'm a plain medical oncologist and a self-taught molecular biologist geneticist. And um, what I'm hoping to share with you today is a sense of how incredibly rich and informative genomic information is being in the management of patients, and therefore the potential for the use of uh, com computer science, essentially, t to lend insights that are going to materially improve human health. So let me see if I've got this right. Maybe so. Um, uh, just my declarations. A lot of what we're doing is about intervening to help patients with advanced cancers or early onset cancers, and we work extensively with industry in, uh, in bringing medications to patients in a rational way. And I'll try to tell you the story of that going forward. So cancer is a big problem in Australia. And in fact, it's the leading cause of death as of about 2017 in all higher income countries. Uh, in Australia, there are about 150,000 people diagnosed with cancer, about 50,000 deaths. The good news is that the five-year survival from cancer in Australia is as good as anywhere in the world at about 70%. To put that into perspective, in 1970, uh, two generations ago, let's say, uh, it was 25%. So incredible progress uh, in terms of improved survival. And there's a very big number of patients, uh, people who've survived cancer. About half a million people in Australia have been diagnosed in the past five years. It's also a big economic problem. Um, as a function of GDP, health is rising in every uh, higher income country. It's 11-12% uh, in Australia. It will be projected by 2066 to reach 16% uh, of GDP. And at the same time, the taxpayer base is going to drop over that time and lifespan is going to be extended such that a third of the population may be over the age of 75 years and cancer is essentially a disease of aging. So it's a very big social uh, matter as well. And it currently costs in excess of $10 billion and is accounting for about one in nine hospital admissions. So what is cancer? Uh, this is uh, my 101 primer. So you see the, the, here a PET scan showing uh, somebody with widespread metastatic disease, but fundamentally at its root, cancer is a cellular problem. It's a problem of shuttling between the single cell state and the metazoan differentiator state of which we're um, apex predators, so to speak. Um, that the cells degenerate and start to behave autonomously, growing independently and ultimately killing us. And it's a fundamental design flaw, if you like, in the human organism. So cancer is fundamentally a cellular disease. And let me go take you back over the history of cancer so you understand where we stand at the present and why this is such an important topic for a, a, a symposium on computational science. So the way we thought about cancer is a mass that affects uh, just grows. And it's been observed throughout human history. There are mummies with tumors in it that we can observe. Uh, but it wasn't until about the middle of the 18th century that an approach systematically was taken to try and treat cancer by using its anatomical site, essentially just chopping things out. And that's John Hunter there, who's a famous anatomist. Uh, colleagues of his, William Holstead, in the late 18th, 19th century in the US developed a mastectomy to try and treat, for example, breast cancer based on the anatomic concept of cancer. Of course, you have to get it early enough for that to make a difference. In about uh, 1820, 1850 in Germany, the first peering down the light microscope revealed the cellular structure of cancer. That cancer wasn't a protoplasmic mass that sort of extruded itself in the human frame, but rather was composed of individual cells. And that cellular basis led to a whole field called histology and immunohistochemistry, which we use today on top of our anatomic classification, essentially to classify cancers in useful ways that allow us to treat people in a consistent way. But it's still not a scientific view. This is not enlightenment. This isn't physics. This is a kind of Linnaean model of a disease where one simply classifies things according to their appearance without understanding the mechanisms that generate generate the disease in the first place. And it wasn't until the middle 1950s 
when the structure of DNA was isolated that we started to get a handle on the mechanistic basis of what is essentially a genetic disease. And in 1963, uh, two uh, uh, scientists, uh, uh, David Hungerford and uh, Noel, first observed the first mutation in cancer under the light microscope. This is a chromosome with a translocation between a, a bit chunk broken off from chromosome 22 was placed in adja adjacent to chromosome 9. It produces an oncogene. It subsequently emerged, but in 1962 they didn't know that. In 1971, biology started to weave into this narrative, and Richard Nixon declared war, war on cancer. And that war on cancer started a really significant so societal investment in making a difference. And in uh, about 2000, the first draft human genome sequence was generated, a proper comprehensive map of all six billion nucleotides across three billion positions that constitute a single cell's genome, the sort of blueprint upon which one could start to create a comprehensive map of this stuff across human cancers. Of course, it took $3 billion and about eight years and hundreds and hundreds of uh, people's work to, to, to get there. But since 2000, uh, the effective reduction in the cost and the increase in throughput of whole genome sequencing, if you want to, to compare it to a $4,000 Apple Mac that one bought in, 4, 000, in 2000, today that Mac, Apple Mac would cost four cents. So that incredible reduction in uh, the cost and the throughput has really put this technology right firmly in the clinic. And when you think about the time frames going from uh, left to right, we're talking about an incredibly short time from having the t tools to be able to understand the genetic basis that drives cancer behavior, at least in principle in 2000, and the progress we've made over the next few years. At the same time, rational drug development, I think um, Rick uh, talked about this in an incredible uh, reference to uh, rational drug development. Essentially, the first uh, targeted therapy was developed. Uh, 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 it was a drug called imatinib mesolate, got on the cover of time because it was a fundamental breakthrough, and it was targeting the fusion product of this translocation here. And today, chronic myeloid leukemia, which when I was a registrar in 1996, was an inev inevitably lethal disease through progression over many years towards blast crisis. Uh, we've rescued very few of those patients. It is now essentially a chronic disease, and some of these people are actually cured by the use of the drugs, uh, the Gleevec, the drug uh, imatinib mesylate. So how does this genomic genetic concept work? So inside every cell, you've got a, an entire complement of DNA. It's in the structures of chromosomes, as I've shown you before, the 922 translocation. It boils down to this nucleotide sequence, which can be considered like a sentence, a massive sentence broken into, um, into chromosomal uh, paragraphs, if you'd like. And what happens in cancer is a single change in that DNA sequence from, uh, in, that, in this case, a C, a cytosine to a guanine, is sufficient in some cases to cause the cell to receive a signal to start growing. It's not sufficient to have only one change. Often there are between six and 20 changes, maybe even more than that, that occur in a cell that are acquired in what's called, considered multi-step carcinogenesis. But recognizing this requires the prism of genomics and the ability to identify these changes. And we, can, we have, over the past 20 years, been doing that at scale. And that was, uh, in 2014, the sort of really big breakthrough was the access to this uh, uh, massively parallel sequencing, which reduced uh, eight years and $3 billion down to two or three days and about a thousand US dollars uh, really transforming uh, this genetic disease. And the way I, th I like to think about this as a, comp as a storage problem uh, as, is that if you go back to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and the last edition was the 15th edition, it went online from that point, it has 32 volumes. If you assume there's more than 1,000 pages per volume at 500 words per page and an average of four letters per word, and you make that the analogy of the human genome, then you have 70 copies of the entire full set of Encyclopedia Britannica of data in every one of the 70 trillion cells that makes up the average human. And that is the state of the computational and data storage challenge and the opportunity in a digitized age. And I will try to show you why understanding this is absolutely critical to human health and in real time. So uh, some years ago, we set up a company to be able to implement this uh, genomic-driven medicine into, the, into, the, into our oncology practice. And it, it, we set up a company, essentially. I didn't expect to do this, but we set up a non-profit company called Omico. 
creating a national precision oncology network, and it focused on two clinical areas, one about molecular screening and therapeutics and one about risk management, because the genetics that we inherit determine our risk for cancer, just as the somatic evolution of that genetics determines, for example, the treatability of cancers within the tumors that we, we, we sequence. And there are a whole lot of social implications, which I've, I've touched upon briefly as to why they're important. So I'm gonna focus initially on personalized risk management. So, of course, the concept is that if you detect cancer early, you can cure it and at the anatomy. If you click at this stage, you're much more likely to be able to save somebody's life than at this stage. But how do you know who's at risk? And so the truth is that each of us is, in this room has a very different risk of developing cancer. Some people have a hugely increased risk. Some people probably have a decreased risk, but we essentially treat most people the same as of today. But we know that the heritable factors of cancer, and this is from a twin study published in 2000, showing that the heritable components of many cancers approaches, in the case of prostate, up to 40% uh, of the etiology of prostate cancer. And in a second, uh, yes, you can see uh, that many of these cancers, not cervical cancer, which is a viral disease, but many cancers have a strong heritable component, which has not been mapped. This is from twin data. So the way that we think about heritable genetics is that in the population, we have about 20,000 genes. Uh, we have alleles of those genes that are either very common, as you see up here on the population scale, or they have a very highly penetrant effect, as you see down here. But th there's typically an inverse relationship. The things that cause cancer that have a weak effect are not selected against and are present at high frequencies. These things, these bad, uh, bad players down here, tend to be uh, very rare, thankfully, uh, but they cause cancer, and perhaps in the case of P53, in 50% uh, in of people by the age of 30, which is about a 20-fold increased risk. So this is the kind of conceptual framework at the population level of what we might discover if we applied genome sequencing. And the initial studies over the past 20 years have used uh, SNP arrays because we've had limited ability to sequence the entire genome. We've uh, done these limited sampling to look at these common variants. And we've understood a lot about various genes that have contributed, at least individually at small effect sizes, to this total heritability. And at the other end, over the past 30 or 40, well, 100 years now, we've recognized that certain families are cursed. Uh, and in particular, this gene P53 causes a very high risk of cancer. And this is a paper taken from 1936 describing, in a somewhat unusual pedigree diagram in the black, all the members of this family that have developed cancer. And in this case, it was about a disease called Lynch syndrome causing colorectal and uterine cancers, and we now understand the genetic basis of these syndromes, but it's been observed for a really long time. Nonetheless, as of about 2015, we only understood, in even the best studied cases, less than half of the heritability of cancers. This is where the opportunity lies of creating a comprehensive map. And these are the best studied ca cancers, which typically occur in an older population. If we were able to understand the entire population, this would completely transform the way which we, we as a society invest in uh, risk stratified early detection strategies. Imagine a woman at the age of 50 who currently gets a two yearly mammogram because that's shown to improve survival from breast cancer. Imagine there are some women who don't need screening at the age of 50 because they've got a lower than average risk and other women who are at such high risk that they should probably be screened at the age of 40. This is the sort of conceptual framework for the work that we're trying to do. I'm going to talk to you about an, in, an experiment which, which we've conducted relatively recently, and that's to create a cohort over the past 15 years called the International Sarcoma Kindred Study. We decided to study this population because I'm a sarcoma specialist. I treat patients with sarcoma, and there'd been no clinical cohorts. The clinical cohort we've created is in 23 centers in seven countries around the world. It now has more than 3,700 families and inf information on more than 120,000 individuals in those families. And we uh, looked at this, uh, we collected painstaking information about the transmission patterns of cancer in those families. And you can see that uh, there's lots of multiple primary cancers. The population average for a multiple primary cancer is about 10%. At a median age of 67 years, this is a median age of 45 years, and 20% of patients have more than one primary. And if we look in detail at their pedigree patterns, we see lots of stuff that we don't typically recognize. And uh, so essentially about one in six people that come into my clinic to see me have a, probably a recognized syndrome. Remember, the framework for this is if we recognize this up front, how would we treat these people differently? We sequenced, using whole genome sequencing, about 1,600 people from that cohort and identified a whole lot of individuals who carried pathogenic variants in about one in 12 uh, 
uh, individuals. And these people wouldn't, wouldn't be recognized without the sequencing efforts. But what I want to talk to you about is about the power of computational science to lend insights into fundamental biology in the space of a mere two or three years. So there is evidence uh, that different cancer types have different biological pathways which are perturbed. For example, in uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer, the homologous recombination pathway, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are frequently mutated. Whereas for, mis for colorectal and uterine cancers, mismatch repair gene defects are, are common. And we have never studied, we've never studied sarcomas, so we hypothesize that these tumors which arise from embryonic mesoderm might have fundamentally different pathways if we could only discover them. And so we set about looking for those pathways. And to do that, we had to create not only our own case set of uh, more than 1,600 cases, but we had to use a, a large set of controls to do a comparison with normals to see what the patterns of mutations were that people were carrying around which caused them to develop the sarcoma. And there's a whole lot of information here. The general point about this is that the total data storage at the NCI, thanks, Sean, for this is almost a petabyte of data just for one study that we're doing at the moment. The other thing I want to mention parenthetically, because it hasn't arisen, is that health data is kind of special. And with increased awareness of uh, hacking and uh, cybersecurity, the way in which this data is stored and the attitudes of society towards that data can be rate limiting to science. And that's another important part of storage of this data. Anyway, we took all that data and we did this experiment where we compared for rare pathogenic variants, there's a definition of those that we used, we did a comparison between the sarcoma cohort and this extremely elderly, well set of controls using a burden test called SCAT. And that gave us a list of about 1,000 out of the 20,000 genes we carry, which had more pathogenic variation than the controls, potentially candidates for the pathways we might understand. We had to do a correction for age, because it turns out that the median age of our sarcoma cohort is about 50 years, whereas this elderly well cohort, although it's relatively depleted pathogenic variation, is actually about 85 years. And so we corrected out for any age uh, differences, uh, genetic age differences, by taking a young schizophrenic cohort, median age of 35 years, and eliminated anything that was differential between uh, the elderly cohort and the young cohort from anything in this gene set, leaving us with a gene set of about 968 genes. And this is where we started to be creative. The, the list of that genes, if the hypothesis is right, ought not to be acting as singletons. It's not random. Those genes, if we did this study on breast cancer, in this gene set, we should see patterns of homologous recombination genes as a group. And fortunately, 20 or 30 years of biology and study has created an ontologic network. And uh, Rick mentioned protein-protein interactions. There are these incredible unbiased protein interaction databases where we could look at whether these genes had a higher fraction of interrelatedness than would be the case for chance alone. Essentially, again, looking for clusters of genes rather than genes individually, looking at sentences rather than letters or words, if you, if you like. And so that led to a, a list of genes by reference to these databases which were highly enriched, and then we looked for the pathways that were enriched in that gene set. And this uh, analysis took us uh, over four million core hours uh, just to do this one uh, an analysis. And this is the outcome of it. It was published in Science in uh, January of this year. And what it shows is each of these uh, nodes is a, a gene. You see right in the center of that gene, sorry, that, that node list, a P53, which is strongly associated with sarcoma. And it's incredibly highly interrelated with other genes which carry an excess burden of variants. But you see here, there are certain groupings up here which seem to be what we call saturated in their interactions. They're interacting in a, in, a, in a way that suggests the biology in general is extremely important. And some of that biology, I'll describe in a minute, is relatively well understood. Uh, there's the capping at the end of telomeres, which is maintained by a cluster called the Sheltron complex. And this Sheltron complex is mutated in sarcomas. Defects in telomere function and maintenance are associated with an increased risk of sarcomas. And, but this complex over here has never been described before. And it's a centrosome complex and uh, associated with mitosis. And it turned out that this cluster of, uh, of, 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 of genes in which we found excess mutations was not only associated with sarcoma, but associated with a particular subtype of sarcoma, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And this is just the most crude and simplistic analysis of the first full whole genome sets. 
latent within this data. We have telomere lengths which we capture. We have the misaligned reed spin, which is stuff that we don't align against the reference human genome. It's a black box, perfect for things like machine learning and AI, especially when you have the framework of a case control design or associations with particular phenotypes. The rich phenotypes are a part of the 120,000 people on whom we have data in these data set, in these gene sets. And what we discovered, just to show how it plays out in human situations, is that the Sheltron complex is associated not only with sarcomas, but with melanoma and thyroid cancers we see occasionally as well. And the telomere lengths in those individuals in their peripheral blood, but not in the tumor, actually walking around, they're longer than people would have normally. All insights into biology, which is made possible by uh, a, a statistical genetics analysis of a new kind looking at pathways rather than individual genes. And this has relevance. Uh, i just show you this study that we performed looking at patients with leaf Armani syndrome with this P53 mutation. We did this as part of a consortium globally, and it's another theme that I think is very important for this conference. And that used whole body MRI to try and pick up these cancers at a curable stage. And that led, within the space of four years, to it becoming registered as an MBS item available to cancer patients today. This is what I meant by this information is no longer theoretical. It can be used with the patients in front of you who are model organisms from a discovery sense, but there's an ethical uh, obligation to try and use that information. In fact, there is a real uh, ability to, to make a difference in their lives. Now, I want to talk about the next phase, which is about molecular screening and therapeutics um, in the last part of my talk, because uh, this is where uh, there is enormous progress um, and uh, really creating quite a social problem. So, of course, uh, I said about 50,000 Australians die from cancer. This is typically a metastatic pattern of cancer patients. Eventually, we run out of treatment options with all the treatments that we've developed over the past 70 or 80 years. And Fundamentally, as I said, cancer is a genetic disease. This is a circus plot from whole genome sequencing showing incredible rearrangements between a primary and a metastatic site. This is information we can derive on patients with the, the sort of clinical pattern I showed you a moment ago. And two things have driven developments in this space. And one of them is, of course, the adv advances in genomics that allow us to test these tumors. But in parallel with that, Rational drug development using structural biology, alpha-fold, Rick Stevens mentioned our ability to project what molecules might interface most effectively rather than doing it empirically. The vast acceleration in these processes have completely transformed the way in which we manage patients within my clinical lifetime. And this just ind indicates some of the evidence for that. This is FDA and the European Medicines Agency approvals since 2019 going out to 2021. This is continuing to exist. These are drugs which are targeting mutations in particular genes, rationally designed drugs which are proving, uh, which are transforming lives. And part of the problem now is no longer the concept of how we might treat cancers, the way in which we might discover these things, but it, it's now about how we have access to the drugs and, and do this in an affordable and sustainable way. Um, in fact, of the 840 molecules in drug development in 2018, 90 plus percent were rationally designed. And that process is only going to accelerate as uh, machine learning techniques like AlphaFold enter the, the, the workplace. And this is a somewhat understated, but I, just, uh, I want to point out that this is a meta-analysis of phase one studies showing the impact of rational drug design and a genomic lens on cancer uh, in terms of response rates. So in phase one, we don't know whether a drug works. We're just trying to find a safe and effective dose. And what you see here is that the overall response rate for patients going onto a phase one study is pretty low. It was about 5% when I was a registrar in the 1990s. It remains 5% if you use an empiric model for drug development. But if you use this rational drug, drug development where you screen a tumor, you find the target, and you batch the right drug to that target, the response rates jump sixfold. And this is a really fundamental observation about the acceleration of uh, the, the, what happens when you have a rational scientific framework rather than an empiric framework for trying to make a difference. It means that knowledge matters. It means that information matters to the patient. It's not on the never-never, this will make a difference for some subsequent generation. This makes a difference in patients' lives today. So we set up a structure where we provided uh, patients with run out of all treatment options with access to genomic screening, which we performed, and then we returned the results 
identifying treatment options for those patients. This is the model of precision oncology. And we started off with eight centers, but we're now open at 23, 28 centers around the country, and we've opened in New Zealand. And this speaks to the, the sort of clinical impact and necessity. We expected to enroll 3,000 patients, but we're now at 7,500 patients. And as I'll show you in a little while, we plan to expand that significantly going forward. And more than 80% of the practicing medical oncologists have bought into this relatively young model of uh, treatment, basically because it works. And a whole range of rare, particularly rare cancer types are being referred onto the program. We get this incredibly rich uh, genomic information, and we've, in parallel with that, invested a huge amount of effort to provide access to more trials. And these are individual trials, and you can see the start and stop dates for those trials. We've put perhaps about 700 patients onto treatments as a consequence of the program going ahead. And this is the punchline of the whole study. About 37.5% of patients have a clinically actionable biomarker as a result of this non-standard, not conventional testing. And uh, this, uh, having this biomarker, you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve of survival for the group that receives a matched therapy is doubled survival. So these patients who die, this is an, uh, what we call a phase one population, they have no more treatment options, their median survival is eight months, but if we can get the right drug to those patients after doing genomic profiling, then rational drug development essentially doubles survival. And that's through clinical trials, not even the stuff that's passed through clinical trials, through proofs of principle. And uh, for me now, the issue is not so much how we uh, understand. This, this was 5 and 10%. I was quoting my patients five, eight years ago. But it's, it's only going to increase over time. And so uh, I'll finish on this note to talk about uh, how we're working with the NCI to take this forward. We've received money now not from medical research or from health, but from industry on a jobs and growth agenda to try and increase the investment in clinical R&D in this country. And we intend to screen more than 20,000, actually 23,000 advanced cancer patients over the next three years, and to work systematically with industry in a private-public partnership to bring more trials into this country. It will create an incredibly rich data set. And maybe that's the point. First of all, we depend upon the NCI to provide us with data storage, infrastructure, cybersecurity, all those things that this data set of sovereign significance needs. But we also are working with an industry partner to analyze the data and to commercialize that to create a sustainable model so that more Australians can have access to, to this sort of technology. And I think creating an environment in which we can do that in, an, in a way that's embedded within the health system, that is driven by research and in a research context, but has the goal of improving health for the patients that take part is part of a realistic vision in which computer science is pretty fundamental. Thank you. So thank you for a very clear talk, and also thank you for your diligence in trying to make a difference to human health. Cancer is a big problem. Tragically, there are some cancers, like GBM brain cancer, for which the treatment options are hopeless, frankly, um, and it is, the world's, it is the leading cause of death in children, so there's no clear correlation with age. And it also appears to be the case that extraction, tumour extraction, isn't a, it doesn't actually solve the problem. So perhaps, do you have any comment on, that doesn't appear to have been progress in that field for 20 or 30 years in terms of treatment options. Mm. Do you think there might be, do you think additional data would make a difference for patients? Data, knowing what you're doing never hurts your prospects for success. Having data always helps. I said there were two elements to this. One is the genomic element and the other is rational drug development. The brain is a very special place. Um, and uh, there, it's not as though there are a lack of what look like good targets in GBM, glioblastoma multiform, uh, which is a, a disease which is essentially 100% lethal and uh, has remained that way over the past, as you say, over the past uh, 20, 30, 40 years. I think rational drug development will find a way of exploiting the particular qualities of the brain as an ecosystem for treatment. And let me just put this into perspective for you. 
that time scale I, I showed you meant that even one generation ago, patients had access to nothing. In fact, lung cancer, uh, when I was a registrar in the late 1990s, or a young consultant, um, had no targeted therapies. It was a leading cause of death. The median survival was around 12 months for a patient diagnosed with lung cancer. Today, there are 11 drug targets in non-small cell lung cancer. There are more than two dozen drugs to those 11 targets. They cover perhaps 60% of the non-small cell lung cancer population, and it's projected that number will increase from 11 targets to 17 targets by 2025. That's the progress that you make by patiently, rationally developing things. There are, there are certainly areas where we haven't made progress, and pancreatic cancer is one, and brain cancers are the other. They're my two highest priorities. That and carcinoma of unknown primary, which is an inevitably lethal disease. I've got faith that as we understand more, but particularly how we start developing approaches to new types of treatment, like vaccine-type treatments, where you get tumor profile, you inoculate mRNA, which generates an immune response against the proteins within the brain, we might see breakthroughs that we've not seen before. I'll tell you just a brief story to give you some hope. These things are always personal. Um, uh, a, a colleague of mine had a daughter who lost her life to cholangiocarcinoma, bile duct cancer, in 2016. That's a disease which in that time frame, seven years, has gone from having no targets to having half a dozen drug targets. What's the odds that with computational power, with robotics, with increased communications, with alpha fold coming in to develop structural, uh, rational structural approaches to matching molecules to targets, that we're not going to see a similar acceleration over the next 10 years. The model works. It's just a question of giving it time. And I think we often lose a sense of that. It was an infinite number of thousands of years before the surgery was first done, and surgery cured a small number of people. Then chemotherapy made a big difference, going from 25% to 70% survival. Going forward, I'm expecting that we'll get to 90% survival by 2040, 2050. And it's my projection based around my uh, three decades in oncology. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, David. That was a great talk. I have two questions time permitted. One is, in terms of the role of non-coding regions of genome and oh, how yes. you have investigated that in terms of their effect. Yeah, so I get so frustrated with whole genomes. We take the coding sequences. We look at stuff that changes protein function according to the central dogma of, you know, codon usage and so forth, and we neglect 99% of the genome. I think case control designs are, are the secret there. That and overlaying over the non-coding sequences, what we've learned over the past 40 years of molecular biology about the different functions and structures within that non-coding sequence, and looking at whether there's an excess burden, I suspect that's where we're going to be headed next. Common variation, which we're only just beginning to combine with rare variation to create the total impression, and going into the non-coding or the dark genome, and I think that's going to require mathematical and statistical approaches and numbers. And uh, the interesting thing is the numbers weren't big to get the breakthrough I described. Partly it was because there was no work in that field, so it was literally like doing BRCA1, BRCA2 in breast cancer all over again. But there's no reason not to think that with the power of the techniques that we've got that we don't need to use the lens of biologists to discover those pathways. We might be able to do that in a much more high-throughput way. And... Um, yeah, non-coding genome is an area of uh, hot interest for us at the moment. That's great. And one more question. In terms of the precision oncology and biomarker-based therapeutic, how do you see the role of multimodal and multi-omics approaches going beyond genomics to other modalities of omics? Yeah, so that's another great question. There's no reason to think the genome is the be-all and end-all, even though it is a genetic disease. And proteins make good targets. There's a class of drugs called antibody drug conjugates, uh, the antibody drug conjugate for the drug Herceptin, or Trastuzumab, which targets HER2, discovered 20 years ago, uh, now seems to work against women who've got overexpression, not amplification of HER2. And that means that there's an increasing class of targets which are going to be protein-based. And so we're going to have to collect much, much more information going forward. It's all driven by utility, basically. And there is increasing utility in non-genomic targets.
Yeah, I, I, what I was trying to communicate here is that moving from an empiric Linnaean classification system to one that's based around the molecular basis by which processes occur has accelerated us from a 5% response rate to a 30% response rate. And that applies not just to the genomics, but to rational drug development. If, for example, you generate a list that's no longer 100 uh, targets long, or 100 molecules long, you're not doing 100 futile trials to get the one that succeeds, you might get 10 that succeed. And of course, all that will accelerate things. And of course, the implication of it is, we need to start integrating all of the data in our health system so that the machines have that data to work on in a structured way. And, uh, but the payoff could be enormous. It could be that what's happened with COVID and HIV, which were tackled through rational approaches, what we did there could be done for the leading cause of death in our society, I believe. Any, bit of a change of pace. I think the only good thing for your interesting presentation